Welcome back again, royal family. I guess I owe you an apology if you're a little confused. I had my numbers mixed up. I've done this like three times in the last month. Goes to show you I got a lot on my plate. Um, it is Matthew Lesson 198. I think I put, uh, I said Lesson 197, last lesson, which it was uh, Matthew 197, but it still said 196 on the board. But at least I had the date right, and I think I got today's date right as well. July 23rd year of our Lord, 2020. The old nature is only a temporary stumbling block is what I've got written for a title. Like I always tell you, I always look for little catchy titles that'll hopefully catch even the unbeliever that's cruising through these different uh, media platforms and maybe they'll say, what's this about? Um, that's one of the reasons I try to make the titles a little bit catchy because we always want to be out there fisher. We're, we're, uh, fishing, we're fishermen, we're evangelizing, we're trying to save a lost and dying world. So um, you never know, sometimes that's the hook that gets them in, and then it's up to them to have positive volition, obviously, toward our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is only one way to be saved. It is believing on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is no other way. That is your altar call for today. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, very important, Jesus Christ is God. He is your Savior, the only entrance into heaven, the only name under the heavens and the stars is Jesus Christ, is the name that we all go to for our salvation. Having said that, you realize that is your only entrance into heaven. That is your altar call for today. The old sin nature is only a temporary stumbling block. Amen for that, right? Matthew lesson 198. Let's jump right into it. We got a lot to cover, a lot of good information. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, and like newborn babes. Long for that pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In order to wash ourselves clean and get connected with our fellowship with God properly, walking in that new nature filled with the Spirit, we go to 1 John 1.8 as, as an example. 1 John 1.8, 9, and 10 covers this pretty well. That's why I use it to believers. If we say that we have no sin, John writes, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and first john 1 10 says if we believers say that we have not sinned we make him a liar his word is not in us so having said that let's take a moment of silent prayer to wash away the garbage and the sin in our life distractions and we are going to say a prayer for this world and the coming together and for safety i'll mention some things that i have concerns about um as far as safety goes. So having said that, let's every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I'm going to adjust my seat and let's say a prayer. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study a word. And we're asking you to bless those that take this message out to a lost and dying world, Father. And let these messages that are going on, these media platforms father find the right ears and hopefully find some unbelieving ears where they can come to study your word and come to realize it is jesus christ that is the only entrance into heaven father and we're asking for your healing hand across this world right now there's a lot of division and a lot of lies there is a problem with a virus father that we're getting different stories from we're just asking for health we're asking for clarity and truth become become to the surface father because that is really what happens, that the truth, the light of truth is like a disinfectant in so many areas, Father. It just cleanses everything, and it has to be truth from you. It has to be your truth, Father, because we know everything is a counterfeit in Satan's system, Father. So we're just asking for your healing hand. We're asking for any of this division to stop, the lies to stop. We're asking for truth to just bubble up and reveal itself as it only can, the light of truth, the powerful divine light of your word and truth just shine, and we can heal and hopefully move forward as a country as a nation keep our leaders in prayer father and touch those that are on the front lines different areas whether they're medical workers or their police or their military or certainly our political leaders father and across the world we know political leaders need to make the right decisions at this time in history we're asking all these things father and we're asking for protection protection that wall of fire for all these believers that follow these doctrinal principles we've been learning father through your son's precious name our lord and savior jesus christ Amen. We grab a drink and I want to say something real quick. I put something on my personal Facebook. Again, I always differentiate between the Patriot, Richard Betez, Rick Betez, Facebook, and PRB Ministry, 
Facebook page, which is strictly just for the teaching of the word and where the ministry goes in that direction. But on my personal page, which says Richard Betz's Facebook page, I did kind of put a warning out there. There's a handful of people that we go back and forth and we share information. We like to research things on the side and find out what lies the media is telling us and historically what things have happened. So we get to the root of problems and focus on the truth. Um, and some of my recent research and people I've spoke to and, and more uh, importantly, those I trust that are online because I do not trust the mainstream media, even the big name. The big names are some of the worst ones. Um, I don't want to go into that. But um, I found, I've come to find out that we need to be very careful if we're going to be in these city areas or anywhere there's big gatherings. I guess I would say if you're in the countryside or out in the suburbs away from the activity, it's not as bad. But we just need to be careful because there are paid um, people that are out there and there are groups out there with nefarious schedules and nefarious ideas about what they want to do and some of them are funded and they have been funded and they have been nurtured and they have been coddled and hidden and they're brought along for a time such as this what we're in right now where people are protesting and things are going on and they're going to be filtered out and we all have we also have a concern about prisoners being released and we want everybody to have a second or a third chance obviously if they've struggled before but make sure that they're the right type of characters that should be released. So I do have concerns, and I did post something, and I have been posting pieces of my book, Discerning Our Time, on my Facebook page as more of a wake-up call. Um, I give them away. I think I only have one copy left. I'll order some more when I hand that last one out. Um, but I'm putting them on there for warnings because I care about people. As a patriot, I'm just trying to do my part, not for fear. If you have Christ in your life, you don't have to have a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, as, as Paul was teaching uh, uh, his, his leaders like Timothy, not to walk around afraid of everything. But we have to be aware of our surroundings. We have to know what's going on. So I'm just letting you know, I do have concerns. I have heard chatter about certain uh, groups that are bigger than we think they are and that are hidden behind the scenes. And oftentimes we forget about uh, certain types of uh, terrorist cell groups that we haven't heard from in a long time and different groups that are funded or that have maybe been in the shadows and they're going to all of a sudden come out during these protests. So just be very careful where you go in big public places. Having said that, we'll keep it all in prayer, not for fear or anxiety. I'm just letting you know when I hear something, I try to put it out there on my personal Facebook page. So here we go. Matthew lesson 198. The old nature is only a temporary stumbling block. As we continue in the study, I want to cover the old sin nature and how it is brought to light in Scripture. And we have been doing that. I use that title today about the old sin nature being a temporary stumbling block because what does that tell us? First, and it, first it really tells us temporary. The word temporary is in there. And second, a stumbling block is only really a distraction or something that will trip you up if you cannot see it. It's only a stumbling block if you cannot see it. If you have your spiritual glasses on, your sunglasses on, you can see it, your spiritual IQ. So look at the word temporary in that and realize any kind of stumbling block, anything put in front of you to trip you up. If you're aware of your surroundings, like I was just talking about, it doesn't have any real impact in your life. First and foremost is the fact that it is temporal. Temporal. Everything temporal in this life. Temporal. The spiritual is what we need to focus on. It has been resolved, all of this, at the cross of Christ. Certainly the temporal here, folks, and it has no endurance in eternity. So anything you're looking at, old sin nature and sin and these type of things and the evil, it has no endurance to go into eternity. So it is temporal. It's temporary. It is no longer an issue if you embrace the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as I did the altar call at the beginning, and accept your position in eternity. Because the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ defeated the angelic rebellion and truthfully, he resolved all rebellion for all time, forever, at that cross. While at the same time, he took upon that divine judgment for all the old sin natures, past, present, and future. We have to learn to accept that and learn to live in that. They got it. There has to be a time where you learn to accept all of that, what the cross has accomplished, and learn to live in it because the conditions of who you are each and every day and the conditions we see around us are very temporal. So don't get caught up in them. Don't let them stumble you. Focus on the spiritual, which everything was completed in eternity past. And when the cross happened, it was already ordained and done in eternity past. The cross of Christ has so many, so many rich doctrines and victories, I would say, attached to it, that we will probably study that cross 
and what happened there in heavenly in the heavenly classrooms for hundreds or thousands of years after we get there in heaven because there's so much attached to the cross of Christ it is truly the center of the universe because the work of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is perfect and we know that and complete he doesn't do anything half-assed as we would say yes I'm a pastor teacher and you can say that it's not a swear word how, in, how depending on how you're using it <laughs> because the work of the Lord to save me Jesus Christ is perfect and there's no half-stepping it is complete we need only remain in it remain in it to have personal and spiritual victories right now in time Christ achieved the ultimate victory folks royal family the ultimate victory upon that cross and you have to accept that and live in it it was done for all of us for us, accept that, realize that, digest that, learn to live in that. We need to accept it, live in it, and keep the focus on our position, the things that are above, not the things down here that trip us up. After salvation, the believer is enlisted in spiritual warfare. Whether you want to be or not, there are things going on that God has already ordained in eternity past that after salvation you would be getting involved in these things if you choose not to that is on you but after salvation the believers enlisted in spiritual warfare in the sense that we remain in the sense that we remain in a flawed system obviously tainted by fallen angels with a nagging human nature in our dna but the power of christ indwelling our soul with free will still playing a major role in God's plan. I'll give you a moment to take a note on that. We need to accept this, learn to live in our victory, and keep the focus on that position. After salvation, the believer is enlisted into spiritual warfare. In the sense, when I say spiritual warfare, in the sense that we remain in a flawed system. Because if everything was done after your salvation, and there was no more race to run, no more fight to fight, nothing left to do, why wouldn't God just pluck you up and say, okay, you're done. You, got, you became born again and saved. Let me pull you out of this. Something happens after salvation where free will and our impact in our personal life means something. You need to accept that. Now, there is a flawed system designed all around us by Satan and the fallen angels. And we do have a nagging, I would say, a nagging human nature still dwelling around in that DNA. But the power, we're given the solution, the power of Christ in dwelling our soul. We, we have the Trinity in us and we have free will now, folks still playing that major role in God's plan. We need to take all these things into account as we walk forward in the plan of God. And many people do not, many pulpits do not touch on these principles that I'm touching on. And it's a shame because people don't know what to do after salvation. They have the question, salvation, now what? Well, there is something after salvation. And it's not a Cadillac in your driveway and a big bank account, just do everything good, and now everything's going to go your way because you're a believer. That's not the, rea the reality of walking in the, the flawed system we're walking in now. There is blessings and rewards in time, and we can look forward to those things, and we can have them in our life. But we also have to face the challenges. You've got to take the good, the bad, and the ugly together, folks. Great movie. Clint Eastwood fan from back in the day, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. But we have to, and a lot of pulpits don't like to touch on this. This is not always easy to wrap our finite minds around, but it is the battle we are called to fight, and we can remain on the enemy sidelines. That's what you do as a believer. You remain on the enemy sidelines when you don't do anything with your spiritual walk, or we can engage as active duty soldiers. God, being the perfect gentleman, has already accepted you into heaven at salvation. No matter what you decide afterwards, you're already accepted. You're already given this great righteousness. He also gave you everything you need to achieve the success while still walking in this flawed cosmic system with a nature still actively opposed to his plan. He's given you all the tools. It's up to you whether you want to use them or not. As I always use the reference, if you have the winning lottery ticket in your pocket and you continue to walk around with it in your pocket and wash it in the laundry machine, it's still a winning lottery ticket, but you haven't done anything with it. It's like walking around being a millionaire and you don't even realize it's in your pocket. You do nothing with it. Or walking around in combat with a great rifle and no ammunition. I don't care how you look at it. Those are great analogies. Let us look at what I'm telling you today and what we're going to be touching on. Galatians 5.16, what does Paul teach? But I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by, you have to do something, and you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. Sarx is the word you're looking at there in the original Greek. 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. The Spirit against the flesh, there it is right there, that's the internal combat. For these are in opposition to one another, so you may not, believer, always do the things that you please. And most of us, 
if we're being honest and we're moving forward in the plan of God, want to do the right thing. We don't always, but for the most part, 75, 80% of the time, we're walking around thinking, I want to grow in the plan of God. I want to be a better Christian. I want to do the... That's natural. That's a good thing. But you don't always do them because you have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde combating in there, we would say. This is human nature, Sarks, you're looking at. The human aspect of mankind, it is void of anything spiritual. Okay, it is just simply the human instincts, the human nature. It is the old sin nature. That's what it's referring to. This is one of the key terms for the old sin nature, the flesh used in the New Testament. The flesh, sin in the singular, the old man, the old self, along with a few other terms, all point us to mankind's fallen nature, the old sin nature. So there are terms that you can see, and then uh, John, Peter, Paul, Luke, whoever, were using these terms talking about the old sin nature. If there were no issues, folks, with the old sin nature after salvation, we would not have all these scriptures I've been listing and I continue to list and I've been pointing out in recent lessons as well as today. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 with me. As you do, I'm going to put a few scriptures on the board to cover even more what I'm telling you, give you more ammunition for the lessons I've been teaching you because you need to write these down and follow through with your own personal studies so you get comfortable in what we're walking in and, and the, the battle you're called to fight because this is a big part of the battle we're called to fight. Now, as I always tell people, if you don't believe that, and you want to argue that, or you think your pastor or your own knowledge is telling you something different, that's fine. You can shoot me an email. I'll send you the same scriptures. I'll go over a few things. But then make a decision. Get off the fence and go follow somebody else. That's all I can tell you. And the reason I've, say, I've said this a lot lately is because I have, and I expect it. I know. From, I was trained very well at Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries, Pastor Bob. That I, I, I receive the email sometimes, or I receive a thumbs down and a comment, and I'm okay with that. I understand that. Those things that come in, I can tell when somebody wants to be combative. And it's different when somebody asks a question than they want to be combative. Because when they want to be combative, no matter what you give them, they're going to say, yeah, but. And after, as my dad used to say, after, anything after but is BS. And you can take and run with that. So Ephesians 4, 2, 22. But that's a fact, folks. And I get those things in. And that's okay. I expect those. But I won't habitually and repeatedly keep sending the same thing back and forth, and I won't get into a heated argument. If that's what you're looking for, go elsewhere. I don't have time. I really don't have time for it, honestly. I don't waste a lot of time with that. Ephesians 4.22, Paul says what? That in reference to your former manner of life, how you walked as an unbeliever, you lay aside the old self. Believers, he's talking to at Ephesus. Believers, lay aside. How do you lay something aside? You're laying aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. As I told you before, your old sin nature gets worse, not better over time, folks. And it is considered old or worn out. It's like saying an old being or a worn out or an ancient being, an ancient flesh, we would say. Polyus anthropos is the two words you're looking at. An old self. Polyus anthropos. It means old or worn out and a, a natural being, a human being. Nothing spiritual, and it's old and worn out, ancient. <laughs> That's your flesh. This speaks to the fleshly mind of the old sin nature. We could put on the mind of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Take on and put off, as I've made, mentioned to you. Put on the mind of Jesus Christ, that new nature. But we have to accept what he did, Jesus Christ did, and then what he left for us to do. And what did he leave for us? Meaning his mind, the Bible the completed canon of scripture, and then he left the helper as he told the apostles, I'm leaving, but I'm going to my helper, the Holy Spirit, coming to guide you in a very unique way. And then he gave us his nature. We are in union with him. I'm in you, you're in me, Jesus told them, meaning all of us in the church age, and I'm sending you a helper. We will give you that spiritual power. So we need to focus on this. This speaks to the flesh, what we're looking at here. No way around it. Old sin nature. We can put on the mind of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but we have to accept what he did and say, okay, I'm 100% into this. I'm not on the fence anymore. I'm a believer. Now I'm going to just buy into 100% of what Jesus Christ told me and said and left for the apostles and what they taught. Then you're going somewhere, but you have to accept it. And you have to realize, what did he leave for us? How do I live in it? meaning his mind, the Bible, what you're studying, his helper, God, the Holy Spirit, and his new nature. Romans 7, 14. I told you, read chapter 7 in Romans. You'll talk about the old sin nature and that a lot. And Paul says what? For we know that the law is spiritual, 
but I am of the flesh. And that's this, from the same word, sarkinos. It's the same root word, sarks, that you saw before. I'm of the flesh, sold into the bondage of sin. To sin, I would say. Carnal. That's what this word means, sarkinos, carnal. And that which is rooted in the flesh. It has no spiritual nature. It is fleshly at its core. Therefore, it can grow into nothing else. It can do nothing on its own. It is carnal. Being carnal or carnal-minded is what it means to walk in the old sin nature. Remember, there is no middle ground, folks. There's no gray area, no middle ground in this situation, I'm telling you. You are either reflecting the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in your actions, deeds, and in your mind and in your spirit, or you're reflecting the nature of Satan at any given moment. There is no middle ground. Now, as I made it clear in recent lessons, the scriptures I'm using all tell us we are dealing with believers. Almost all the scriptures I've given you Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, all these scriptures I've been getting into the last two or three lessons, and even today, all are pointing to believers, lessons for believers. Born again believers, folks. 1 Corinthians 3.1. Pick it up in 1 Corinthians 3.1. Again, Paul is talking to brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, believers. 1 Corinthians 3.1. And I, brethren, believers, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as the to men of the flesh. There it is. As to infants in Christ. Infants... Because they're already born again, but they haven't grown up. They're believers. Men of flesh, it says. Men of flesh. There it is right there from the root word sarks that I told you. Already highlighting a human nature void of divinity. Void of spirituality. Void of anything divine. It is the human nature. 1 Corinthians 3, 2. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. For you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, for you are still fleshly, there's another version of that word there, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not, are you not fleshly, he asks, and are you not walking like mere men, is the question. You're not walking like believers. Sarkikos is the other word. Same word, is used in a different tense, in an adjective form, in a different tense, meaning fleshly. Carnal, always pointing us to opposite of divine nature. Always the polar opposite of divine nature, which means it points to the old sin nature. There is no other way to interpret this. Paul clarifies by saying, walking like mere men. Again, he clarifies, he's adding on top of that, that not only is he saying, okay, you're fleshly in the old sin nature, I'm pointing out, but you're walking in that nature. So there's a dual definition of the old sin nature in two, in two parts of one scripture right there. There it is. Paul clarifies, walking like mere men, speaking to unbelievers' nature. You're at, you look like an unbeliever to me, but you're a believer. That's your old sin nature. 1 Corinthians 3, 4. Paul says, for when one says, I am of Paul, another I'm of Apollos, are you, of, are you not mere men? What is Paul saying? They were bringing strife. Remember I told you tension, strife, pettiness into the church. Pettiness and strife. These different little tensions and different little divisions and schisms, however you want to say it, into the church. Two signs of the old sin nature hard at work. Pettiness a petty spirit, a pettiness, and any kind of strife and tension between people or groups of people. It's all old sin nature at work. Anytime you feel strife and tension between you and somebody else, there's some form of the old sin nature bubbling up, trust me when I tell you. Or you see somebody acting petty about something or not forgiving somebody else or you're feeling very petty about something, the old sin nature is hard at work, folks. 1 Corinthians 3.5 what then is Apollos, he asked, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. In other words, yes, we're both ordained and we're supposed to be doing what we're doing just because we might have different uh, styles or personalities or IQs or whatever. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Paul says, Apollos watered. He was grooming you after I taught you the initial message. But God was causing the growth, always God. That's who picks the pastor teachers. I don't care what the degree is. I don't care how high intellect somebody is. They went to this college. They were ordained by this one. It all comes down to God because there's a lot of men that are ordained and have pieces of paper that don't belong to be pastor teachers. It's quite simply, you can watch their teaching and listen to what they say. Apollos was a pastor teacher for years, possibly. Many scholars claim he was one of the original group members who followed John the Baptist. So you can trace him all the way back to John the Baptist in those early days when John the Baptist was proclaiming Christ is coming. This was an eloquent speaker, Apollos, and a good teacher. Eloquent, good teacher, good man, good spiritual man. But Paul is telling the petty Christians 
at Corinth that all this comes from God. Stop bickering over this and thinking, I'm from him, I'm smarter than you. That's what this came to. Paul's calling him out on pettiness and bickering. Stop the competing and comparing. Gets nowhere, competing and comparing. Ultimately, God is allowing both men to teach, obviously, and I dedicate this to two parties. This right here we're looking at right here. Two parties I dedicate this to. First is the Christians who want to compare teachers and try to evaluate and elevate one over the other. And you get a lot of that. Well, my teacher's better than this. And my teacher, every man is different. Hopefully you're not saying a woman pastor. That's a whole other lesson for another day. But every man is different. Every man has different personality quirks. Every man is being led by a spirit in a different area to teach Every man emphasizes different things in different ways. And some men are here to strictly evangelize, and that's all they do is evangelize. Other men are here to take a deeper look at end times and maybe tear that apart. Other men, if they're teaching accurately, are supposed to be involved in New Testament majority of pastors. I'm saying it right here and right now. You can argue with it. Majority of pastor teachers calling is New Testament mystery doctrine, church age mystery doctrine. Majority of pastors should be teaching that. I'll let it go at that. I won't put God in a box. But I dedicate that to two parties. And the first party is those who want to compete and compare and say, yeah, my teacher is better than yours. If someone is teaching accurately, folks, and you are growing, that is awesome. Applaud. I give you an applaud. Keep growing. Stay with them. Don't assume, though, that that teacher fits everyone's needs and has all the answers. Don't assume. And the second group I dedicate this to are the so-called intellectual men, uh, hopefully men out there, that's who they claim to be, who try to undercut pastor teachers by critiquing every message and ripping apart everything they teach. I, that's the second group, those really high intellectual men out there that are either have a pulpit themselves or even worse, in my opinion, don't have the you-know-what to get behind the pulpit and stand in their conviction and grind it out and teach message upon message, and still they critique and rip another man apart. Listen, you want to call out a denomination or a certain type of movement? Go ahead and do so. I do that occasionally from this pulpit, but I'm careful not to throw a name out there, and I'm very careful not to just rip on somebody for no apparent reason. Remember in Philippians when Paul said some are teaching from wrong motivations? He said to the Philippian church, but Christ is glorified anyway. Philippians 1.18, what then, Paul says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, it doesn't matter what they're teaching for. Christ is proclaimed, and I'm going to rejoice in that. Yes, I will rejoice, Paul says, that they're teaching Christ crucified. Not that he rips into anybody. And in fact, even when he calls out Alexander the coppersmith, and he calls out two or three men here and there along the way, he doesn't go into details and go out of his way to keep hammering and ripping at them. He puts it out there to certain leaders in the church and says, just beware of these men. And he leaves it at that. I'll hand them over to Satan. What is it, Hymenaeus and Alexander? We've covered this before. But he doesn't go into detail, keep trying to rip those men apart. If you have all the answers, I say to these kind of guys, if you have all the answers and you have such deep wisdom and you're so highly above everybody else, stop attacking men who are standing in their convictions and go out and teach what God revealed to you. Grow a pair and get out there. Some people have way too much time on their hands, and that's all they want to do is stay on social media and rip people apart, or they have nothing else to teach from their pulpit except attacks because they're insecure, and that's a shame. Let me move forward so I don't get caught up in my old sin nature in that one. The perfection of the original garden was shattered by the eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know this, opening up that old sin nature, we would say. Romans 5, 12, what does it say? Therefore, Paul teaches, just as through one man sin, Armatea, entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. This speaks to a trespass or a violation of God's divine law, God's divine order. We say missing the mark. You, didn't, you shot that arrow and didn't even hit the target of what God had in line, and what God considers righteousness. Harmatea, used here twice, speaks to Adam's negative decision first, that choice he made to take the fruit. 
He came over there and saw that fruit instead of being in control and realizing I've been taught differently. He started to accept the fruit. That's the first problem there, the choice he made. And then you see the secondary personal trend of sin he brought into the old sin nature, the, into mankind as the old sin nature, which brings spiritual death. Adam's original sin was taking that fruit from the woman and knowing full well what the Lord had already taught him and the standard set in that garden. He was well aware. He was the leader. This is because all created creatures, folks, all created creatures, by that I mean angels and human beings, the ones we know about, have freedom, have free will. A nature is given to them that can do as it pleases, free will. This is why angels were able to rebel. This is why man can rebel. Adam's personal sin was a rebellion like Satan. That is what is addressed as the old sin nature, folks. Man switched from the love of God as his, what we would say, orientation to the justice system of God by eating the forbidden fruit. That's when he took that bite and started to eat. Man came from the hand of God as what? A perfect creature with free will, with the potential to do what he pleases. All creatures are given that. After his fall, he came under the integrity, I would say, of God, which is God's justice system. Now you've got to deal with the righteousness and justice of God. That gets brought to the forefront once he bit into that apple, once he made these decisions one after the other. Now God has to go switch from the love, we would say, into the righteousness and justice. And now the whole wheel starts to spin for mankind. And now it gets revealed what the plan is really all about. Take a note on this slide. We could say when he was biting into that apple, a switch took place. A switch. God's love was in full authority concerning the perfect garden, the design, and even designing and creating the original man and woman. God's love was in full authority. God's justice or his integrity had to be incorporated once the fruit was eaten. Let me say that again. God's love was in full authority creating the perfect garden, creating the man and the woman, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, giving Bible classes and teaching what's going on, giving them doctrine, we would say. God's justice or his integrity had to be incorporated once the fruit was eaten. Showing us God cannot turn a blind eye to ungodliness. Anything that opposes his nature, he has to filter through his justice system. Anything that opposes his nature is not as pure and righteous as he is. His standard has to filter through his divine justice system. God imputed to all mankind the nature or trend, we would say, to sin from the original man, Adam, meaning that spiritual death of separation noted in the second use of the word sin in Romans 5.12 is highlighted. Those who teach sinless perfection after salvation lack any understanding of the nature passed down through Adam. Those who teach sinless perfection, and some do, after salvation... And there are some that do. There are some even preachers that have come out and said that, you know, I don't sin anymore now that I'm born again and saved. I'm pure. That uh, blows me away when you hear that. Those who teach sinless perfection after salvation lack any understanding, any doctrinal knowledge of the nature passed on through Adam, the original sins we were saw in the garden. 1 John 1.8, John writing to, and I use this all the time at the beginning, if we, we believers, say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, the truth is not in us, believers. John has included himself in this lesson, a believer. If you read from verse 1 and really fully understand how it's written, if you go from verse 1 right through, 1 John 1, 1, 8, 9, and 10, but if you start in verse 1, it is pointing to self, we, guys, me, is included in all this. It's clear lesson speaking to all believers, encompassing himself in that group. In fact, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, all speak to believers, all three letters, addressing born-again believers in one aspect or another. There is a reason we need to be born again. That's where we get the term, we want to be born again. There's a reason for it, because the first nature, Adam's nature, is flawed. Therefore, the second nature, coming from the Lord Savior, Jesus Christ, we can count on as perfection. Amen? Go to Romans chapter 6, royal family. Romans chapter 6. I hope you're following along with this and understanding it. As you go to Romans 6, look at this. Colossians 3, 5 on the board. Therefore, Paul says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. 
This is the old sin nature. It is sometimes referred to in human body parts and even a member of the body and even a heart, as we will see once we get back into Matthew chapter 15. In fact, Matthew 15, 19, we're going to be going back to that soon. Not the, not probably for another lesson or two. I got a lot to cover here with this series. But eventually we're going to get back into Matthew 15 where we started. And verse 19 speaks of the heart. It's a body part. So sometimes it's referred to in that way. We will be noting in the heart in Matthew 15, verse 19, we get back to our original study. Now, the Apostle Paul had taught salvation and justification, and then the grace principle. He starts emphasizing the grace principle, principle Excuse me, in Romans chapter 5 toward the end to the Roman believers. Then we see a rhetorical question starting in Romans chapter 6, because they're learning about grace Deeper principles about grace now. These are born-again believers. Romans 6, 1. Let's pick it up there. Rhetorical question, Paul says. What shall we say then? Question. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may be increased? Because now he's teaching grace and they're thinking, you could t somebody could take this and run with it if they're a baby believer, if they don't understand grace. May it never be, he exclaims. How shall we, we who died in sin still live in this type of sin? How do you, how do you, uh, if it's nailed to the cross, why are you putting it back on as I use the terminology? Don't use your, found, your newfound freedom in this grace principle as a license to sin, Paul is saying. Paul is teaching what grace is really all about, folks. He actually comes out and points to the old sin nature handed down by the first Adam. If you look down uh, Romans 6, 6, jump down a few verses. I'll put it on the board. He gets into the old sin nature here, handed down by Adam. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old self, there it is right there, what did I tell you, is crucified and was crucified on that cross with Christ in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. A little stumbling block here and there when we don't pay attention, that's all it is. It's not our master anymore. We're not a slave to sin, verse 7. For he who has died is free from that slavery, that sin, that nature. In other words, we have a choice, folks. We have a choice to live in the old sin nature or the new nature. The sin nature need not have power over the believer. If you don't want it to be. You want it to be your master, stay away from the word of God. Stay away from bouncing back into the plan of God and washing yourself clean habitually. And yes, the sin nature will become your master again. Go down to verse 12, Romans 6.12. Pick it up in Romans 6.12. Look what Paul goes on to say. Romans 6.12, therefore... Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, believers, because this is a problem maybe going on there, so that you obey its lust, because that's what will happen. It will become a master again. Paul is warning them because obviously it is something believers were struggling with and will struggle with. That's why he's writing it and saying it in this manner. Romans 6.13 And do not go on presenting. In other words, some folks may have been presenting their bodies in an ungodly way, walking in the old nature. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. You only can reflect Jesus Christ's righteousness when you're connected to that nature that's in there. Verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you. What I was just saying, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Stop getting involved in the rituals and walking in the old man. Legalistic rituals and religion also is sin. There it is right there. The Greek verb for presenting, you see presenting? The Greek verb is an action, folks. Verb is an action word. The believer needs to do something to present. Parastime as it is. Parastime. Present something. This is like the taking off or putting on of the old nature. Remember I said it was like a shirt? It's the same type of principle. Parastime. Take it off. Put it on. Present. Do something. Verb. Action. Believer. Paul is teaching the believer we make a choice to be under the ownership of one nature or another. Ultimately, at the end of the day, whoever controlled you during the day, the old nature or the new nature, take a look in the mirror. It's nobody's fault but the man or the woman in the mirror. Romans 6.16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves, there is again to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Which nature? Either of the sin resulting in death. It's, it's spirit. It just, it's, it just brings death into your life. Yes, you are born again and saved. When you sin, you don't go to hell because you sin. You're a believer. But you're living in death. You're living in a separation 
from God. While you're walking here on earth, you're actually separating yourself. You're driving a distance between you and God. That's a death form of death or of obedience resulting in righteousness, shining that righteousness of Christ that's in there. This is a clear choice, folks. A clear choice between sin and righteousness. There is no other way to interpret this, but Paul is teaching the believer we are slaves to one nature or another. Clear, clear lesson. One nature or another. One of them can become your master. Look at what Paul goes on to teach these believers. Romans 6, 19. Again, jump ahead. Romans 6, 19. I'm speaking in human terms, Paul is saying, because of the weakness of your what? Flesh. Your old sin nature. Believers. Teaching them grace. I was getting into justification, salvation, justification, and I'm talking about grace in chapter 5, and now we're in chapter 6, and Paul is going on more about walking in that new nature. It is not a license to sin, but I'm speaking to you on human terms because that flesh is so weak. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, sin just uh, uh, begets sin and turns into an evil lifestyle. So now present your members. How do you do that? You make a choice. Present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. In other words, you're already, you're already justified. You are sanctified. You have a new nature and everything. Walk in it. Build upon it as you go forward. So there is, there is that spiritual growing, that spiritual moving, that shining of the righteousness, and that clarifying your how sanctified you truly are. I am speaking about the struggles of your flesh, Paul says. I'm talking to you believers about the struggles of the flesh and how to get out of them. The weakness we have until we are face to face with the Lord. Amen. Now present your body, meaning do something, believer. Make a conscious choice in one direction or another. Grace doesn't make the positive believer feel like sinning more. Grace, when you understand it and learn it, Grace and freedom and God's mercy, those things that we live in here in the church age and we understand now fully, that was when the Bible was first being written and building up to the completed canon of Scripture, now we understand grace, freedom, and mercy completely and we live in it in the church age. It doesn't make the believer feel like sinning more. That's the teaching of legalism, folks. That's the teaching of self-righteousness and scared pastors who want to keep their congregation scared. Be a good girl or a good boy or God's going to come smack you down. Grace in the right nature wants to get closer to God, not further from God. Grace, when you're in that new nature and understanding grace and living in that grace and freedom and the mercy for your past failures, it makes you get closer to God, not further away. What did Titus 2.11 tell us? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. It's a grace gift. Verse 12, instructing us to what? Deny. Not live in. Not a license to sin. Deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And to live sensibly. Balanced life, as I've taught recently. Having a balance in your life. Sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, this church age we're living in. When the believer truly understands grace, that is. They adjust to the justice system of God very easily. They understand it. They understand it's a name and sight that's sin. When you fumble and fall, you wash it clean and keep moving forward. You focus back on that position. Don't worry about the condition. Forgetting what lies ahead is Paul taught. Look forward to what lies, uh, excuse me, forgetting what lies behind, Paul taught. Look forward to what lies ahead. You understand how to adjust to the justice of God. You're living in grace. When the believer is walking in the old sin nature, they reject the calling of God. It fights and kicks against truth. Therefore, we need to make consistent decisions inside the plan of God, flowing, as I've been teaching, flowing in that righteousness we are given at salvation. You see, the area of weakness in our human nature is revealed in Hebrews 12.1 as well. What does it say there? Revealing that area of weakness, that stumbling block I said at the beginning. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, what is that all about? Angelic and human surrounding us. Let us lay aside. There it is right there. How do you lay something aside? It means you had to pick it up to lay it aside. Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And don't we carry all this burden and all this confusion and all this sin nature and all this stuff with us. Lay it aside, he's saying. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. After salvation, now what? Race. Battle. 
warfare. There it is. This scripture set, really set on its own. You set this scripture on its own. It speaks directly to laying aside the old sin nature. No other way to look at it. And the fact that there is an angelic conflict actually is wrapped in this as well. Spiritual invisible warfare that is being watched and observed by an audience. And not just the human audience, folks. There is a great cloud of witnesses that surround us, spiritual, watching decisions, positive or negative in the plan of God, the spiritual and physical witnesses. This is why we are called to run the race, fight the good fight after salvation. There is a supreme battle, a conflict occurring, and we are invited to participate. You're invited. You don't have to accept the invitation. You can bounce in and out of the party, as we would say. But you're invited. Everyone listening to my voice knows that they have areas of weakness. Amen? I hear a lot of amens because I'm saying it. Everyone listening to my voice knows, and you better know, you have a lot of areas of weakness and sins, plural, <laughs> that easily entangle us. Almost everybody listening to my voice, if you're being honest, can list at least three or four sins that you struggle with in your life. They're your personal issues. Don't worry about it. Your personal sins are not a big issue. It's not even judged your, your sins aren't just, it's taken care of on the cross. That's not the issue. It's what do you live in right now? How do you, how do you gain those blessings, rewards, and crowns in eternity and right now in time? It's not letting this sin nature tangle you up, but everyone listening to my voice right now, being honest, can list three or four sins, maybe more, that tangle you up. Now, as you grow spiritually and time goes on, maybe you're 15, 20 years into the plan, some of those fade because God is working with you and you're flowing habitually in his plan. Therefore, he can dwindle that old sin nature and those sins that easily entangle you begin to peel away a little bit at a time. But don't be fooled. They're there in the background as long as we're, as long as we're in this flawed human body. They can come bubbling, as I always say, right back to the surface if we don't obviously feed the new man and we start to feed the old man too much but all of us have these issues folks amen isn't it a comfort to know we all have encumbrances meaning weaknesses and sins that easily entangle us and make us stumble not a big deal it's dealt with on the cross but those that teach everything is lollipops rainbows and unicorns after salvation they are not accurate with what they teach you know what I mean when I say lollipops and rainbows and unicorns. It's a lot of that name it and claim it crowd and you're born again and saved. Now just act like a good boy or good girl and God's going to fill up your bank account and give you everything you want. And then six months down the road when this believer gets in a jackpot, and I always use that in a negative sense, then they're going to look back and say, well, I thought God was blessing me. What's going on? Because they're not prepared. Their pastor teacher didn't prepare them. This leads to confused believers who become frustrated believers, who then become apostate believers. That's the math. Confused believers eventually become frustrated believers, who then become apostate believers because they feel shame or guilt or failure. And they don't want to live in that. Or, even worse, they exhaust themselves from operating in the flesh and works programs to please God. And eventually they say, I can't do it anymore. You see, we are given the blessed assurance of victory already is given to you, completed on that cross at Calvary. Accept it. We are given divine power, a divine power source, until we are experientially able to live in that perfect position of resurrection bodies in the heavenly. And it's coming. It's already given to you. Trust me. You're a believer. It's already there. Learn to live in it and focus on that in the heavenly, right? The things that are above, not the things down here causing you problems. But God always sees his divine son, his righteousness, more importantly, Jesus Christ's righteousness, when he looks upon the believer in time. Even in your worst moment, when you're going to God and cleansing yourself from your worst moment of time of sin, God immediately sees that righteousness shining in there of his son. Find peace in that, and you'll recognize grace in action. If you find peace in that, and by finding peace in something, it means you come to a place of rest and faith is strong and you can sit. It's like sitting by, as the scriptures always say, sitting by the, 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 the grass field and the brooks that are going by and the birds are chirping. And you just have this peace. It's an inner tranquility. Find some of that. Get to that place with your relationship with God and recognize grace in action. 
You don't earn or deserve anything, yet God gives it all to you when you are agreeing with his plan and flowing with that plan inside of it. Until you get that mindset and realize that and just get yourself walking in that new nature habitually, you will not understand this peace I'm talking about, the tranquility, and really focus on grace and action in your life. Realize something. God accepts flawed creatures. Amen. Thanks be to God that he does, right? Wretched man that I am, as Paul says, right? God accepts flawed creatures, not only accepts them, he says you can be seated at the right hand of the throne in heaven, acknowledging his precious son. Just by acknowledging his precious son, you're seating yourself at the right hand of heaven. I don't care what kind of past problems you've had. Let us, we're going to close in Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. But isn't that nice to know? That you're welcomed into divine royalty of the heavenlies. And because Christ is seated at the right hand, God's saying, you got his righteousness. You're in union. You got a piece of my son in there. Come on in and grab a seat and relax. Don't worry about that past mistake. Live in what I give you, the grace. We need to recognize the old sin nature, not agonize over it. You guys are going to Romans chapter 8, but I want you to listen to me. We need to recognize the old sin nature. When you recognize something, it's like looking at this lamp and saying, oh, I see it's there, it's on, I know how to turn it off, I know how to turn it off. I see that, I recognize that lamp there. We need to recognize the old sin nature, not agonize over it. Not. We need to know our limitations in the flesh and accept no boundaries in the spiritual. We need to know our limitations in the flesh, get familiar and say, okay, I know my weak areas, that's all right, I know my limitations in my flesh, but I accept no boundaries in my spiritual walk. We need to keep short accounts in the old nature and long accounts in the new nature. Amen? It's not complicated, folks, nor is it anything to do with our flesh or works programs. You understand that? It's not complicated. It's not about your flesh works programs. It's all about free will choices, decisions every day that lead to lifestyle successes later on that God ordained for you. He already ordained and set those goals and blessings already there. He just wants to open the door and let them fall in your lap. And they come here and there along the way. It's not like all of a sudden the floodgates open. Occasionally it does happen. I've heard a handful of stories of believers that I trust that said when the floodgates opened, they opened all the way. And sometimes that's the way it is because you've reached such a level of maturity. But I don't know. Everybody's different. I know for me in my life, there's different times I felt the God's gate or door open up and things drop in my lap and it blows me away. And I'm like, okay. And it's almost like I'm on this treasure hunt and I keep going forward. Things drop and they were already there. But God is dropping them along the way. Romans 8.3. Go to Romans 8.3. For everybody, it's different. Your spiritual walk, my spiritual walk. It is what it is, folks. Okay, so don't try to put it in a box. We don't do that. I'll never do that. I try to be open. You know, Romans 8.3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, the law and the flesh can't mix together. God did. How did he do it? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he reflected us in the human body, but he didn't have any sin nature. And as an offering for sin, that's what he was, he condemned sin in that flesh. So Jesus Christ said, yeah, I'm going to go in that weak flesh body and look like them. And when I go and do that, I'm going to still be 100% God, 100% man, and I'm going to walk like this from now into eternity, forever and ever. And I'll take the hit for them. Look at what Paul is teaching the believers in Rome. The law on its own means nothing. And done in the flesh, it is beyond weak. You cannot do nothing with it. So God had to send his son to deal with it to fulfill any laws and commandments. Then God dealt with the old sin nature through his judgment on the cross with the Lord, where the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ stood as a sacrifice for all of us. I don't think he, no, though, even if you're out there and you don't have a family member that loves you, look at the love Christ has for you because he died for everybody. He died for the men and women that stood and laughed at him on the cross and rejected him and will burn in the lake of fire. He died for them as well. They didn't accept the offer. He laid it on the line. Romans 8, 4. So that the requirement of the law, all these commandments, all these laws, all these things that are so hard for them to apply, might be both fulfilled in us. Hey, church age believer, it can be fulfilled in you. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There's the standard. You can't walk in the flesh to fulfill it. You have to walk in that spirit. 
This tells us it might be fulfilled, might be fulfilled. It's a good version, New American Standard, very accurate, because you have to have what? If something might be, it means it's there. It maybe it will, maybe it won't. You have to have that Holy Spirit, which means you believed in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to receive the helper. No other way around it. Christ is your avenue. You go down. Unbelievers are said to walk in their flesh. We're walking in the Spirit, believers. Romans 8, 5, for those who are according to the flesh do what? And this goes for believers. They set their minds on the things of the flesh. They're stuck in here. The stumbling blocks keep stumbling, making them fall. Because they're really not focused spiritually. But those who are according to the Spirit, walking in and are tapped into the filling power of the Holy Spirit, the things of the Spirit will be on their mind. Set your mind, it says. Another analogy of getting filled with God the Holy Spirit here. Washing yourself clean, getting filled with the Spirit, having the mind of Christ operating in your life. Romans 8, 6. For the mind set on the flesh is death. It is separation. Even for a believer, you have to understand what I'm telling you here. Even as a believer, you don't lose your salvation. You never can lose your salvation. I don't care what you do. It cannot happen. If you're going to say, what about if I'm a murderer or a rapist? Study David. Study Moses. Or what if I cheated on my husband or my wife? Study Abraham and Sarah. Study David again. <laughs> what if I deny the Lord after salvation? Study Peter. I mean, I, I can keep going. What if I'm a liar and a swindler? Take a look at Jacob. Even after, after salvation, folks. I can, the list is pretty long, folks. Romans 8, 6. For the mindset on the flesh is death. This means there's a separation when we're in the flesh. Even though in eternity we're secured, when we want to walk in that new nature, we start putting that fellowship or that distance between us and God in jeopardy. Never losing it. It's just like I always do tell people, what, you ha what happens when you decide to walk in that flesh is like owning the best cell phone in the world. You bought it. It's 100% yours. It's yours forever. It has great service. But you put yourself in an area where the signal is not taking and therefore, you can't make a call out, or the call is all broken up. But the cell phone's still yours. You make a conscious decision to move to another area, and now the signal's back. Understand what I'm saying? For the mind set on the flesh is death, in verse 6. But the mind set on the spirit, that's where you get this peace, this inner contentment, this joy, this happiness, and life from, real life. When we are filled with the new nature, we have true life and true peace. Romans 8, 7. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. Believer. So if you're hostile towards God, how are you having fellowship? How is your fellowship accurate? For it does not subject itself to the Lord God. In other words, it's not walking in that new nature. It can't apply the word of God, for it is not even able to do so, verse 8. And those who are in the flesh, believers as well, cannot please God. Nobody can. You're opposed to God. This whole lesson is designed to teach believers that if their mind is fleshly, they cannot please God, meaning they need to get right in their mind. There's something they need to do. Wash it clean, get that fellowship right. Romans 8, 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, ladies and gentlemen, he's teaching them. If you're indeed in the spirit, if you're indeed in the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not what? Belong to God. He's not a believer, in other words. The Apostle Paul is telling them a matter-of-fact statement that when you walk in the old nature, you're just like an unbeliever, and you're causing a separation between you and God in time, obviously not in eternity. And the fact that they all have the indwelling of the Trinity means they are believers, and if anyone is not, they do not belong to God then. Romans 8.10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of Christ's righteousness... And this is first-class condition, folks. You know the Greek first-class condition. I know he is. Paul is he's teaching the majority of believers in this letter. If Christ is in you, and I know he is, folks. In fact, most of the scriptures Paul is teaching here are in the Greek first-class condition, if you look at them. Which means he knows if, and I know it's true. Romans 8, 11, but if the Spirit, there it is again, of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and I know it does. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Tap into it. Filling power of the Holy Spirit. Indwelling of the Trinity being brought to light in these scriptures. 
meaning we have access to another nature outside of our human nature, our flawed nature. In Romans 8, 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh. Don't let that be your master. You don't owe that anything to live according to that flesh. Paul warns that this is an obligation to what? The plan of God, that new nature. You have an obligation to contract with that. Meaning, beware believers who go astray because we can go astray. That's the warning in Romans 8.12 as well, speaking to believers. Romans 8.13, for if you are living according to the flesh believer, which means you can. Again, remember the first class condition, you must die. But if you by the spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is another Greek first class condition, meaning some believers can live and will live and probably were living in their flesh. And Paul was maybe warning a handful. Romans 8, 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Romans 8, 15, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. And I've covered this one before. That's the affectionate scream of Daddy, I love you, Papa, Daddy. That's how it's, 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 uh, it's, it's meant to, to be highlighted. And that speaks to also when we wash ourselves clean, we're like a prodigal son or daughter coming back with our arms open, screaming, Father, I agree with you. Your plan is right. I, I want that righteousness shining forward. That's what it speaks to. Whether you believe that or not, I guess maybe next lesson could help hammer that, uh, that uh, 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 principle home to you, which I've been trying to hammer home for two or three lessons now about the old man and the, the new man and how you can't escape in Scripture and how it's taught. And it's taught very well in, in a lot of different aspects, whether you're talking about the flesh, the sin, singular, meaning the old sin nature, the old man, the old self, the new self, put off, take on, uh, members of your body, present yourself. These are all things that you have to do. The, they are all actions a believer needs to take to be filled with the Spirit and walk in that new nature. I hope you've gotten a lot from this message. We have to continue on this series. I find it very, very pertinent for all believers to understand this. I feel very strong that the Spirit's leading me, that I need to get see this series through. It might be two or three more lessons, and then we'll get back to Matthew chapter 15. I thank you for your time. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, bless those that take these messages out to a lost and dying world, and continue, Father, to move this ministry forward through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.